All right, it is uh, Friday. It's September the uh, 12th, uh, 2012. And uh, this is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, where you'll find the largest compilation of original interviews of independent third party candidates this year for 2012. Over 51 were on the ballot uh, for Congress, um, the House and the Senate. Uh, we have interviews with independents, libertarians, Green Party candidates like today, Colin uh, Beeman and uh, and actually uh, it's running in the 8th District for New York uh, for the House of Representatives um, as Green Party candidates. He has uh, a Republican and a Democrat contender. He's the only um, non, uh, you know, too big to fail parties, you could say. And uh, so uh, we're on this quest to get information out to people. Thomas Jefferson said, unless if you have a fully informed and educated public um you, you know that's what basically that's what you need for a, a, a thriving democracy a true democracy and colin it's great to talk with you today um and thank you for taking the time to uh share your ideas so we can um you, you know kind of you get some of your views and and a little bit about your thinking process here but uh, if you could please tell us sir um about your district this year about uh, just a quick kind of bio on you and um and also what motivated you to be in the running, to be in position, if people want it this year, um, to uh, you know, be uh, representative for the 8th District of New York in the U.S. Uh, Congress, sir. Sure. So, um, I mean, my background is uh, I'm a, uh, an activist writer, and in, in 2007 I embarked on a project called No Impact Man, where my family and I lived as environmentally as possible. Um, I wrote a book about it and made a documentary film about it. And the reason was because um, I was worried at that stage about um, climate change um, and um, other things to do with how we run our economy and wanted to bring broader public attention to it. So I, um, I wrote this book and made the film and uh, started a nonprofit called the No Impact Project, which is about helping people to become involved in the environmental space. Um, but as I went through this, I saw that all of our problems are interconnected. So, for example, climate change comes from the fact that we use, uh, that we burn too many fossil fuels. Um, the, the, the war in Iraq is it, at least in part about protecting our fossil fuel, uh, our oil industry interests in the Middle East. Um, the military budget, the, the, the amount of money that we have to spend on the military means that we don't have money for our other important programs like education. So it's all interconnected. And um, the reason why I'm running for Congress in central Brooklyn uh, in New York State is because I don't believe that the two old-fashioned parties, um, the Democrats and the Republicans, and I call them old-fashioned because I don't believe that they any longer represent the interests of the people of the United States. The reason why I'm running for Congress here is because I feel as though those two old-fashioned parties aren't bringing a conversation about the real emergency that we're in um, to, to the people or about real solutions. So um, I'm running for Congress on the basis that we should be investing in communities, not in multinational corporations, but we should be investing in local business. Local business um, tends to operate more efficiently in terms of the environment, but also creates more jobs. Um, and um, and so we're looking forward to the, the election in November. Well, um, how, may I ask you, sir, um, that we, we do look forward to that. How long have you been, um, a, you know, a member of the Green Party? Um, <clears throat> so, excuse me, the, um, I've been in the Green Party... Um, I'm a recent convert to the Greens. I've been disgruntled. I, I, I would, my, my kind of philosophical home for a long time has been the Democrats, but I'm particularly disappointed with the fact that the Democrats seem to be as much in the pockets of the big corporations as, as the Republicans are. Um, and I, you know, sometimes I joke with friends that um, the good thing about the Democrats is that as long as they're in power, will go down the drain slightly more slowly than we would under the Republicans. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because I don't, I, I, I don't believe that either party is actually facing up to the big problems that we have in our country and in our world. 
Yeah, or, um, or even think that there is. I mean, it, it, some people could argue, you know, there's a lot of advances nowadays. Our standard of living is better. I mean, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, but we can at least try to, uh, you, you know, see the forest through the trees and have a bigger um, vision of what could be, uh, you know. I mean, I would consider... I mean, there are a lot of advancements, of course, but, um, you know, we're not even scratching the surface of our p p potential, you know, and if, pe if this is what people are satisfied with, undeclared wars, um, you know, a $16 trillion budget, that's in no way an investment, it's just corporate welfare, a bailout, and one party uses the other party as cover so they don't have to, you know, deliver on the promises that they had promised while they do all the opposite things that they can campaigned on. I mean, enough's enough. It's a vicious cycle. It's turned into a vicious cycle. So we're definitely going down the drain with either of them. And, it, it's, you know, it's draining on the economy. And, and so we need, there are other solutions. Over 70% of all districts have an alternate solution like yourself. And um, so, I mean, the Green Party is strong in New York. Um, you know, the Libertarian Party is strong in Texas. I mean, I've interviewed a couple of people in the New York area there. And, um, and so, I mean, the Green Party, um, I mean, it's not it really, make, I mean, what this would make a big message. And, uh, I mean, you don't want to just elect anyone who's an independent or third party, of course, someone who's going to keep their oath to the Constitution, let's say. But, I mean, what are some of the things that um, you won't hear from the Democrats or Republicans that, or, or, you know, that we haven't heard in a long time? And what's missing from this uh, debate here, uh, Colin, that, that we won't hear from them? Well, one thing is money out. Of, one thing is money out of politics, and I, <clears throat> the political system is supposed to be there to represent the people of the United States and to make sure that we have good, 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 happy lives. And so, um, as a Green Party candidate, uh, I, and one of the reasons why I'm running as a Green Party candidate is no Green Party candidate is allowed to take any sort of contribution from corporations. So I actually believe in publicly financed elections, which is something they have in some uh, uh, countries in Europe, so that the idea is that no money, no private money can be used to influence our politicians, which would leave our politicians uh, with the job of actually representing the interests. In other words, uh, saying leveling the playing field. <coughs> Absolutely, leveling the playing field and making sure that politicians are not unduly influenced by things other than the interests of their voters. So that, that's one thing I guess you want to hear from the two old-fashioned parties. The other thing is um, that I believe that um, we should have a renewable energy-based economy. This is a Green Party platform, not for the sake not for the sake of the planet, but for the sake of the uh, people, people who depend upon the planet, which is our habitat for clean water, clean air, clean food to eat. Um, but not only that, if we were able to to um, to build a renewable energy economy, like power ourselves through solar, through, um, through wind, geothermal, under, uh, hydroelectric, instead of burning fossil fuels, then we wouldn't be having to fight uh, wars for oil. Um, also, by transferring to a renewable energy economy, um, the, the things that we would have to do, like retrofitting our buildings for energy efficiency, would create millions of jobs. Um, the studies show that uh, a renewable energy sector would employ, employ four times as many people as the fossil fuel energy sector. And, um, you know, if you listen to the presidential debates recently, you heard about the, <coughs> excuse me, $30 billion in subsidies we give the fossil fuel industry. I would argue our subsidies to the fossil fuel industry are much higher since, um, uh, you know, our wars in the Middle East are largely about protecting oil industry in interests. And that, are, so I would argue that our military is actually uh, a private security force for the oil industry. And if we had a renewable energy economy, we would have that military presence in the in in the Middle East, and we could bring that money, bring our our young men and women home, and bring the money home that we're spending to fight those wars. Yeah, I maybe have more goodwill around the world as well, and, and maybe open up some of some trade to some of these countries and, and, and really start uh, engaging them that way. Um, and uh, Major General Smedley Butler, um, one of our most decorated Marine generals, um, said something exactly what you said. He, he wrote a book called Wars of Rackets. Um, this is someone who has the credentials, if anyone does, 
um, it, more than anyone who had criticized him, at least, um, uh, of saying that, you know, it's really, I mean, when he served in the military, he felt like he was a private um, security force for a lot of corporations when they went into South America and, and that hemisphere. And uh, in the kind of wars we were engaged in, it seems like, you know, while the end goal ended up being, you know, profiteering for large corporations, whether that was their goal or not, that was the result. And uh, so um, that that's that you know that's a big big issue that we're not going to hear from the Republicans or the Democrats at all. And um, and uh, with I, I you know I'm assuming here that anyone's listening uh, knows the difference between Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, if they if Iraq didn't have oil, Iraq, the country that didn't attack us, um, if they didn't have oil, um, I mean, do you think we would really be there? I, I, I can't really picture us being there in the first place. We would never would have had the first Iraq war, probably, if they didn't have oil. I mean, uh, we're willing to send our troops and, and, and violate, Colin, I, I don't know if civil liberties is a huge issue for you, but that's what really got us motivated to want to get the word out here. I mean, they're passing the NDAA, the Democrats and the Republicans together. Um, you know, the Patriot Act, uh, you know, and all these horrible um, draconian uh, you know, nightmarish type of uh, legislation that they're voting against the Constitution of the United States of America when they do that. And uh, does that concern you? Um, our civil liberties, our due process, um, you know, it, it kind of puts a fear in mind if, you know, you feel like protesting or something like that. Well, this is, I mean, what I, I believe that our democracy was founded on the basic idea that, um, that the people of the United States provide the wisdom upon which the government can act. And the only way to get that wisdom is actually to get the people involved in the democracy. So anything that stands in the way of people freely expressing themselves, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, um, freedom of religion, um, stands in the way of actually the government getting the wisdom from the people through the democratic process. So, you know, to me, civil liberties uh, and, and if we're sacrificing our civil civil liberties, what on earth are we fighting for? You know, people talk about the American way of life, but the American way of life is based on these civil liberties. So what are we defending if we're actually degrading our civil liberties? I mean, <clears throat> you asked me earlier, what would you what would you hear from a candidate like me that you wouldn't hear from the Democrats and the Republicans? And another thing that's very important in the district I'm, uh, I'm running in is... Um, is criminal justice um, in the sense that many of our uh, youngsters here in the district, district end up in, uh, in jail because of drug violations. And um, one thing that's important to me is that studies show that 70% of people who were incarcerated committed their crimes under the influence of drugs or, or alcohol which to me shows that what we have is, a, is not a criminal problem, but an addiction problem. So this is something that should be dealt with by the health sector, not by the criminal justice sector. So one of the things, the other platforms that I'm running on, is that we should help our young men and women rather than putting them in jail. And all the studies show that sending young men and women who committed their crimes while in, under the influence of drugs or alcohol sending them through a, rehabilita a drug or alcohol rehabilitation program actually has the effect of causing less crime in, in, in the neighborhood from which they come because we're actually treating the problem that they have rather than just sending them to jail, which everybody knows is just like, um, like an academy for criminals. And anyway, is actually more expensive. That's the other thing. Rehabilitating drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs are actually cheaper for our society, which means less taxes. They're cheaper and they're more effective in terms of preventing crime than jails are. So, uh, you, so those, that, those are uh, good figures, and um, it, it definitely is an academy for crime. I mean, you're going to make people worse off and, and worse for society and themselves. And also, uh, the second biggest academy for crime probably right now is like the Republican and the Democrat Party. But um, so... Uh, Anyways, um, they, I would even go as far as, like, I mean, maybe for youth, yes, they should get some help. Education is very important. People don't want to burn themselves out to doing drugs. But I, I, I can't um, 
see like how we can tolerate uh, people that are in victimless crimes where they've broken a drug rule but they haven't done anything that would have harmed anyone else um, like totally victimless crimes whether whites or blue collar and uh, and and that they should even spend one second behind bars um, and you know these are families I mean think about husbands and wives that are split up from their kids I right. mean for someone doing drugs I, I mean um, I mean, you don't want the kids in a bad environment, but I mean, you have to look at the scale of it. I mean, alcohol is legal, and and, and marijuana at least is less toxic than that. And um, so, it, there, there's a lot. I mean, we're you know, it, it that is something you won't hear. And I mean, that's kind of a litmus test. I mean, in a sense, because that kind of draws a line between real people who want to represent people, uh, whether. You might not agree with legalizing marijuana, but at least decriminalizing it, because here's a fact that might not be pretty to hear. You know somebody who's done it. Um, Fifty percent of the people in this country have done it. And uh, so if you can envision putting them in prison, if we have equal justice under the law, then, you know, then let's have equal justice and either let a lot of those people free or lock up uh, half of us here. And um, so that would be nice. You know, what they say is that we're, the United States spends some $5 billion a year on, um, on regulating marijuana, on, 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 uh, on law enforcement with regards to marijuana. At the same time, we hear that the regulatory agencies that oversee um, white-collar crime on Wall Street don't have enough money. So it, it seems to me that the, that the crimes that were committed on Wall Street that caused the entire world economy to collapse are crimes that are much more, that are far more worthy of pursuing than these small marijuana crimes. So my thought is that we should take the five billion dollars a year that's used to enforce the marijuana laws and instead use them to make sure that Wall Street is run in a way that keeps our country and our world safe. Yeah, and, and, and there's, a, that's, it's just about choices and uh, what you're saying about the, um, the, the waste of money that, that we waste in our empire spending, um, uh, not metaphorical, I mean, almost literally empire spending, and um, and, and, and the bailouts, uh, it hurts us in two ways. Not only does it put us more in debt, but it also um, is, is the unseen potential of what it could have been used for. Um, so it's a double whammy, um, uh, negative stone hitting two birds at once, and uh, I mean, I wouldn't be so against solar or whatever if, if, if it's, it's better than spending it on the empire, and that's something. I think um, here's a how about here's a question for you. Like, wh how would you appeal to conservative people who consider themselves conservatives, um, uh, libertarians, um, independents um, that that might be more leaning that way as well? Because you're the only alternative candidate in your district, um, and. Uh, uh, all right, so continuing with that thought, I had, think I had some audio technical difficulties there, but we're right back here. Um, the, the, the question that I was um, getting at, if it wasn't clear before, is that how would you appeal, um, uh, because you're the only alternative candidate, um, but you would be someone that would make a big impact, uh, and this is a year where Congress has a 10% approval rating, um, so if that really reflected in Congress, there, you know, the, the third party should be the Democrats and the Republicans, and, um, but anyways, there are people who are libertarian independents um, as well, and, and other disgruntled Democrats who are loyal Democrats, um, but uh, how would you appeal to, like, the whole broad spectrum I mean what is your appeal I mean I would say I would rather at least see you know money spent on solar I mean geez cut our electric bills reduce the demand I mean even if you don't believe in global warning warming that that's the whole point if people don't believe in it who cares I mean as long as they are for the things that will reduce it um, whether it exists or not I mean we should be for solar even if there wasn't global warming it's a win-win situation and um, so let's just get practical about it and uh, that's something that would pay for itself, I, I mean, um, it would create American jobs, uh, would reduce demand, which would also reduce um, how much, uh, you know, trucking industries and things like that, um, you know, have to pay for gas, which would reduce food prices, it would have a cleaner environment, etc. I, I mean, um, so how do you appeal to uh, not your just your base, sir? Well, I, I, I mean, it seems to me that um, 
especially in this year where people are so angry at both the parties. I mean, this, and why are they angry at the parties? If the parties aren't the old-fashioned parties. They're no longer in touch with the people. They're not. They're not. They're not uh, representing the interests of the people. And it seems to me that a good old-fashioned um, conservative and libertarian value is the idea that large powers should not be interfering in our individual lives. And for the longest time, and continue, the, the Republican Party continues to talk about this, as though government is the biggest interference in our personal lives. But the truth of the matter is, is that if there's one power that interferes in our individual lives the most, it's the big major international corporations who are deciding what we can hear. Here in Brooklyn, for example, um, a big real estate developer is developing something called the Atlantic Yards, and it's, it's, it's open now into a big sports and um, entertainment arena. And they actually were able to use the powers of eminent domain to kick people out of their homes to develop this thing. So the big powers in our lives now, the things that are actually choosing how we live are the big international corporations. So it seems to me that any, any true libertarian, any true conservative would believe with me now that the power of the big international corporations is what needs to be limited, more so than government. And um, we now have the situation, as you know, of the corporations actually spending vast amounts of money to influence the elections. And so I think that uh, a, a stand, and that this is not this is not an anti-business stand. I, I mean, I think if you look at the Green Party platform, it's I mean, it very much favors small businesses and, and things like that. I mean, it's not what you might expect. That's exactly that's exactly right. And there's lots of reasons for small business. And small business small business is the type of, of business that generates the most wealth for the most people, the most jobs for the most people. The big corporations, I think of them as when, when a big box store comes to a neighborhood, studies show that 10 years later, that neighborhood actually has higher poverty rates than it did before the big box store arrived. And that is because big box stores, their entire business model is uh, based on cheap labor. And then they take the, they don't, the profits that they generate don't stay in the neighborhoods where they are generated. The profits are taken to, back to corporate headquarters. So it seems to me that, that uh, a, a good libertarian would agree with me and the Green Party that we actually need to break down the power of the big corporations. Yeah, and, and hey, I'm fans of Ralph Nader. I'm fans of Ron Paul, Dennis Kucinich. I, I mean, the, I, I see commonalities there that are more important at this urgent time in history. Um, and uh, so, Colin, wh one of the questions we've been asking everyone here um, – before we close here is, and, and you can also add more to this, is that who's some of the people you've been thinking about lately? Like, I'm sure you're on a campaign, your mindset must be a little different. Maybe you're, you know, thinking about some past people in history or nowadays, or, or even, you know, p potential people in the future. If you could tell us who you've been thinking about um, and, and why, if you wouldn't mind sharing that. And then, and what, what, what um, are, you know, upcoming events in your campaign and or debates and things like that, sir? I mean, I think the people that I think most about are the people who believed in in nonviolent approaches to change. I, I, I just really um, believe that, um, you know, Audre Lorde, the, the black feminist writer, she said that you, you cannot dismantle the oppressor's house with the same t tools with which he built it. And to me that means that a system that's built on fear and anger can't be replaced by using fear and anger. We have to find a, a, a new way. You know, in the United States, <coughs> we tend to fetishize competition. But I think this is a time where we actually have to begin um, to actually fetishize cooperation. We have to find a way to cooperate as a society and give up the fight between the groups and actually learn to work together. So it's the nonviolent, you know, people like Tolstoy um, who believe that the, the basic tenant of Jesus' teaching was resist not evil, that the idea is not to resist evil, but to bring, not to resist bad in the world, but to bring more good in the world. Well, that's had um, a lot of practical results, too. I mean, if you look at, you know, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and probably lots of others, I mean, that's where you can 
have uh, an imp impact, and we need to Absolutely. occupy the House of Representatives. Absolutely, and I believe that the, you know young people around the United States are sick to death of the attack-based politics of the two old-fashioned parties, and that the way to bring young people in is to begin to look at loving solutions instead of instead of fear and anger based fights well one um, slogan i like from gary johnson is he says be libertarian with me just this one year i would say if you're living in the eighth district or you can support even if you're not be green with colin for this one year i mean be green with colin for this one year right that's, that's so kind of you thank you so much and it's been lovely talking to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And um, I'll, uh, yeah, keep, keep in touch and uh, look at uh, the success of your campaign. And um, so Godspeed and have a great day, sir. Thanks. Thank you so much. Goodbye. And for those listening only, uh, Colin's website is votecolin.org. V-O-T-E-C-O-L-I-N dot O-R-G. And to make a correction, uh, when I said the date, um, this recording is actually recorded on Friday, October the 12th, not September, it's October the 12th, 2012.